Good morning, everyone. Um, happy Tuesday, I would like to say. And welcome to another Aruba Post-Corona, A Better Normal um, series of Zoom presentation organized by the University of Aruba and hosted by the Center for Lifelong Learning. It is today, June 30th of the year 2020. And together with my guest speaker for today, we look forward to having another very interesting um, presentation. Before we start, um, and as with every um, presentation, I want for you to take note of the webinar features. Um, you might just see myself and the speaker, but do know that you are with several others in this Zoom um, webinar. Therefore, I would ask that you use the chat box to give a shout out, type your name, let us know from where you're uh, Zooming in, um, from which organization, and just to say hi, good morning. So use the chat box for that. Then there's a specific Q&A box, which I would like for you to ask your questions, um, which are directed towards the speaker. So your questions that which, which will be answered at the end of the webinar need to be posed in the Q&A box. Um, next to that, I keep on saying have patience um, with us, with the internet, um, depending on technology, it's always um, unsure. So should your internet fall out, just click on the link again and rejoin. And should our internet fall out, then um, yeah, click and wait until we rejoin. And last but not least, at the end of this webinar, um, once you close your uh, browser, there will be a pop-up asking you to fill in an evaluation form. And I do really ask that you fill that in because your feedback is highly appreciated. And with that, we can prepare better for our next uh, Zoom presentation. So today's topic is going to be, Donald, what's here? Yeah. Yeah. Aruba post-corona economic recovery, the role of Aruba civil law. And who is our guest speaker? Well, if you haven't recognized him, his face, he is no other than Don Taylor. And I have to say, even though Don is not a native of Aruba, he loves Aruba dearly. Um, originally from Jamaica, he has been a lecturer here at the University of Aruba for quite some time. Um, and he lectures in international business law, economics, finance, and accounting at the Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management Studies here at the university, FHTMS as we call it. He is presently pursuing research in law and economic stream with a focus on property rights, bilateral investment treaties, and bounded asymmetrical power in international agreements. So Donald, I hope you're ready for it because I know it's going to be quite an interesting presentation. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Um, my name is Don Taylor, and the purpose of this session today, this is a presentation about the civil law in Aruba and economic growth and recovery. But to put it in context, we need to compare Aruba civil law with the common law, which is another legal family. And so we'll, we will be referring to that from time to time as we go along. Now, the civil law and the common law are two of the largest legal families, and this provides some context for this discussion. The civil law is in most European countries on continental Europe and their former colonies, such as Aruba. It is a centralized, codified set of rules, and with the civil law, you know where you stand. With the common law, on the other hand, it was um, born out of the um, Magna Carta of 1066. It is flexible and adaptable and evolved out of English law, and it's an evolving legal system. Now, as it relates to Aruba's economic recovery, the 2000, or economic status, the 2019 IMF report on Aruba notes for diversification efforts to reap dividends, Aruba will need to tackle several structural impediments to growth related to the business environment, governance, and labor markets. As a rule book considers how to execute an effective response to the virus, it needs to consider how best to restructure the economy to limit the exposure, this type of external shocks and others going forward. In effect, it needs to consider 
diversification of the economy as a method to build economic resilience. The IMF report continues. Reforms to improve the business climate needs to be reinvigorated. And a recent survey reveals that over 6% of firms perceive current law as impeding job creation and a thriving economy. Several national regulations were identified as problematic for entrepreneurs, but the two most cumbersome were the business license and establishment permits. Over, over 70%, almost three quarter firms found that they create unnecessary red tape. Aruba's economic responsiveness to the coronavirus should consider legal origins as a factor that limits its capacity and capability to execute an effective restructuring of the tourism dependency paradigm and consider introducing new economic models that would challenge its more economic status. In other words, it needs to diversify away from the tourism dependency as quickly as possible. Urban economic development promotes GDP as the single best economic measure of economic well-being of the country and uses GDP per capita to measure how well off we are economically compared to peers in the Caribbean and the world. And quite honestly, Aruba is well off compared to other Caribbean countries. Its GDP is about $25,000 per, per capita per, per person per year. And this compares well with other Caribbean islands. Um, but, and so we're among the top 10. And so for example, um, the highest is Cayman Islands, where it is 81,000 US dollars per year. Um, Virgin Islands, it is 35,000 US dollars per year, and Bermuda, 88,000 dollars per year. So these are some of the, this is a group in which we are in. And as you can see, the GDP per capita has increased steadily over the years from 2013 to 2018, and it continues to increase. But this comes at a cost, and the cost is that it's driven by deep economic dependency on tourism. So the civil law as a legal superstructure that in broad terms provides rule of law. Um, it recognizes legal rights and obligations of the economic agents in society. It facilitates the enforcement of contracts and the protection of property rights, and it has robust dispute settlement mechanisms in place. So it meets most of the rule of law criteria um, of any developed state. However, in these broad terms, there are limits to the civil law because of this state-centric feature as compared to the common law. In the post-coronavirus environment, viable sustainable options need to be explored that facilitates a broader dispersed economic development model that facilitates societal imperatives for more diffuse economic growth. And by diffuse economic growth, we mean growth that allows for a wider diffusion of entrepreneurship in the society. So there must be a symmetry between the legal system and the proposed economic models that are under consideration. Options have to consider the legal framework or Aruba's legal origins and be constructed within a legal architecture that supports the economic platform that seeks to respond to the coronavirus in an effective way. In other words, you need to come up with an economic model that fits the legal system so that the full potential of the economic system can be attained. A robust civil law system may not work as effectively in an economic structure that measures success by increases in GDP, the maximization of individual wealth, and the acceptance of growing economic income inequality. If the asymmetry is large and fundamental, then this impacts the pace, level, and direction of the economic diversification efforts. Bear with me. Implications for law of the type of economic response and the, the post-coronavirus direction of the economy Research on economic law by Porto et al. has shown that the common law does a better job at encouraging the type of economic growth or economic development as evaluated in terms of GDP growth. And as you can see there, 
when uh, there's a comparison between developed and developing countries, you can see that the common law does well in developed countries, um, not so well when it comes to developing countries, but there are possible reasons for that, which we will explore at the end. In the post-coronavirus environment, viable sustainable options need to be explored that facilitates a broadly dispersed economic development model that reflects societal imperatives for more diffuse economic growth. And as I indicated, the diffuse economic growth means more equitable growth that allows for everyone to share in economic output rather than those that are directly or indirectly involved in the hospitality industry. Now, civil law states place more focus on state-centric legal codes that challenge neoliberal conceptions of home economicus and place limits on the unbridled individualism required in a free market economy. And that is one of the challenges of the civil law in that it, if it's not modernized, it will continue to limit individual freedom in terms of starting a business, in terms of growing a business, in terms of seeking new directions for a business. For individual creativity and innovation to become unbound, which could lead to economic diversification, a robust civil law system has to adopt some of the approaches of the common law in its relationship with the individual. Why? To encourage more entrepreneurship, individual creativity, and innovation that challenge social and technological norms. To modernize a robust civil law to accommodate and facilitate more competition, better asset allocation of res limited resources, and less state power and control over those resources. So that you build up a market-based economy rather than a state-based economy. The profit-making system is the best allocation system devised in history. And that comes from Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater Associates, a hedge fund that is one of the largest hedge funds in the world. But if a robot seeks to develop new, a new economic paradigm, then it, it is best to consider whether the economic models are aligned and consistent with this existing legal structure, the civil law system. Economic models that would subscribe to neoliberal theories of free market dominance are ill suited for a robust civil law system. These are the models that require freedom of capital flows, a high level of individual individualism and minimal state inv involvement. The social welfareism of the civil code limits the economic dynamism required to recover from the economic effects of the pandemic. And as the IMF report notes, policy should protect the workers, for example, not the job and both the human capital. So law, legal rules protect the, protect the job, not the worker, according to the IMF. Labor market regulate, this caused labor market regulations to be rigid. Procedures for terminating employment contracts are cumbersome and costly, creating disincentives for voluntary resignations and hiring and thereby impeding labor mobility and job growth. So the IMF recommend policy that should promote labor market flexibility and at the same time provide effective protection to workers. A robust legal system may not have the flexibility to facilitate the emergence, therefore, of a fully engaged market-driven economic growth that is necessary to recover quickly from the coronavirus. And this is a comparison. This is Singapore's GDP growth. And this is, we compare Aruba to Singapore, which is, again, a small island, uniquely placed in the, in the world. But as you can see, it has consistently shown year-to-year -year growth of 1.2%, year-over-year growth of 1.2%, and quarter-to-quarter -quarter growth of 3.8%. And the reason for that, it is, has developed industries in manufacturing services and airport and exports. And one of the reasons for that is that it is rooted in the common law system that allows for individual entrepreneurship and encourages individual entrepreneurship and foreign direct investments in non-traditional sectors. However, 
um, as I noted, Singapore's legal heritage is rooted in the common law system. And as I noted, it takes about one hour to start a business uh, in, in Singapore, and it costs less than $1,000 as compared to Aruba, where it takes a while. Aruba's legal civil law system embedded with pockets of anachronistic labor and other legal rules, rules that constrains the potential of market forces to drive sustainable economic development forward in a post-coronavirus global economy. A new conceptualization of an economic framework that best fits the legal structure must be considered, and that must be distinct from the neoliberal focused conception of shareholder wealth maximization and free market dominance, if, and that it ties in with legal structure. So I introduced to you donut economics, and some of you are familiar with it, the concept already. And this is a new approach to economic thinking. The concept of donut economics puts the state in charge of economic development and abandons the neoliberal ideal of continuous GDP growth. And it is better suited for the civil law system than the common law system. The central premise is simple. The goal of economic activity should be about meeting the core needs of all, but within the means of the planet. The donut does not bring us the answers, but a way of looking at things differently so that we don't go on, keep on going doing our, our plan the same, executing the same plans and structure the same structures as we have done in the past, because that does not work and that is not sustainable. It's boring. The outer ring of the donut is com composed of the ecological ceiling that can be expressed in terms of the nine planetary boundaries that climate scientists have identified as crucial not to violate if we want conditions on our planet to remain hospitable for future life. Sorry. The inner ring provides the safe and just space for humanity, just as the economics feels when it goes beyond the ecological boundaries of the outer ring, it also feels when it does not provide for the well being of human beings. When human beings go hungry and fall or fall into poverty and homelessness. And this is in contrast to the current economic paradigm where of neoliberalism, where you can, this is a byproduct, homelessness and poverty and income and inequality is a byproduct of GDP growth and development. Between the two sets of boundaries, the ecological ceiling and the social foundation, <clears throat> there is an ecologically just space in which humanity, humanity can thrive upon to what's worth who conceptualize the donor economics. The four implications for human well-being on the donor economics consists of de-emphasizing growth in terms of GDP and wealth extraction and focus on climate stability, clean air, protected ozone layer, among other sustainable goals. It challenges acceptable paradigms of economic and social inequality as byproducts of economic growth. It seeks a transformation of economic priorities from local to global and for communists to become regenerative and distributive by design instead of focusing on shareholder wealth maximization. It provides a roadmap for sustainable economic development by acknowledgement of human and global depend interdependence that is tied to interplanetary health. So it is much more a satisfying option than a maximizing option as a, than a maximizing model as the current economic model is. Donut economics is a better model and fit for globalization, social and economic equity, which neoliberalism our current economic models ignore, and that's why you have income inequality and, and poverty and homelessness. And as an example, Amsterdam as a, as a city has embraced donor economics as for the people and the planet, and it is executing some of the concepts of donor economics in that city. But this should not be a surprise for law and economics 
because it is the best fit economic model for that legal system. So conclusions, well, and to conclude, while a critical analysis of the challenges of the legal system is a good first step in assessing its role in driving an effective economic response to the pandemic, there are various steps policymakers should consider given the inertia and conservatism embedded in a robust civil law structure that could enhance its value and relevance in a post-coronavirus context. These are suggestions. Consider changes to the labor laws to eliminate market, labor market rigidity in a manner that promotes human capital productivity and efficiencies. As the MF suggested in its report, Europa should eliminate its job protection mechanism and focus on protecting workers' well being by establishing some sort of unemployment insurance or something like that. Further, if employment termination costs are high, Entrepreneurs will be less inclined to risk capital for in other non-tourist related sectors. So that is something that if we want to diversify the economy, the labor market will need to be adjusted to facilitate the such diversification efforts. A robust financial system is bank dominated, as Taylor Peterson pointed out in an article, and states with better developed financial system in terms of debt and breadth of systematic assets and capacity experience fast economic growth upon to the research we did. The legal system should encourage movement from bank dominance to greater development of financial intermediaries to allocate capital within the economic system. And the emergence of, of credits is an example of that. But that allows for entrepreneurs to seek financing and to start business much more easily than the banks, bank dominated systems. Or the change number three, consider the role of local capital formation and capital allocation in driving economic development. Local capital accumulation is somewhat enclavic in that their culture and other cases where local capital pools accumulate and are not efficiently deployed within the entire economic system to drive economic growth. So the law needs to structure, this legal system needs to structure or to incentivize capital to effectively deploy it away from these enclaves into the wider economy. Number four, adjust the legal framework to attract more direct foreign investment in non-traditional sectors. And I've put AI and robotics as all the advanced technologies because that requires knowledge and that is what Aruba has. Um, but rather than the traditional sectors of tourism where that is not being led by um, by the legal system, that is just led by profitability and return on investments. So foreign direct investment is coming to Aruba, but that is being driven not by the, or, or not deterred by the legal system, but by the opportunities that foreign direct investors see in making money out of the tourism sector. The consequence of that is that it deepens the tourism dependency that Aruba has. Thank you for the opportunity of presenting my thoughts in this post-coronavirus discourse. Let me know if there are any questions or concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donald, for that uh, presentation. And we have one question already. And that question is, um, well, actually there are two questions in one. Um, so I'm curious in which are, so I'm curious, the person says, in which area of the Aruba civil system do you see most restrictions? Do you see it in consumer law, intellectual property law, company law, et cetera? I see it in um, company law. I'm not quite sure about consumer law. Uh, those are somewhat protective measures. And intellectual property, I think the intellectual property law is fairly strong and consistent with international standards. But I think in terms of the bureaucracy, that's embedded in starting a company is somewhat that it's which is unduly legalistic is is a challenge for 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 new businesses because what that does is that it it's, it comes up the process of starting a business so for instance some information that i have here as i said before singapore takes an hour to start a business and less than a thousand dollars in Hong Kong, it takes two to eight weeks to get a, a, a approval for a business 
um, and again, the cost is a thousand, less than a thousand dollars. Um, in the United States, it costs four to five days to get business licenses, and less than a, and I have a number here of one eighty two dollars to get to be registered. Um, in Jamaica, even um, everything goes through the company's office, and it takes hours and, and substantially less than a thousand dollars. So that is where I think that there there's an opportunity for change. Also, in terms of the labor market, there needs to be an there is an opportunity for change, and there needs to be substantial changes because entrepreneurs are not going to risk hiring people; they can't fire them if circumstances change. And so that needs to those are the two years that needs to be adjusted right away. It is interesting to note that there is not a fundamental problem with the civil law versus the common law system. Um, I'm not saying that the civil law is worse than or the common law is better than a civil law system. In fact, if you look at the World Competitive Index, the Netherlands is number four in the world. The top three are Singapore, United States, and, and Hong Kong. Those are the top, and these three are civil law countries. Um, so what it means is that while the Netherlands, Netherlands has modernized the civil law system, Aruba is left behind and has not done so and it needs to do so if it wants to encourage economic growth and res re economic resilience and changes its economic paradigm. Um, there was also a question, another question, you just touched on it. If you can give a brief, a uh, bit more of a brief explanation about the e economic resilience in Aruba context, in the Aruban context. Well, there is not much of an economic resilience in the sense that um, we have told 98% of the economy is dependent on tourism. Now, um, while we can survive for 43 months, we had to go to Holland, you know, to get aid to survive. So it shows that there's no resilience at all. And once you the fact that you have to seek external sources of cash to finance your government and activities, it, immediately after the virus hit us, it shows that we are not resilient at all. So what we need to do to build resilience is to encourage other activities that are non-dependent on tourism that can help us to sustain us through a crisis such as this happening again, or sustain us through this um, a, cri a crisis that could be caused by anything such as a September 11 incident. Um, so what we need to do is to encourage entrepreneurship, but for that you need to change the laws, encourage um, and, and change the laws in terms of labor laws and company formation. I need to encourage foreign direct investments into the island that is not related to tourism because direct investments for tourism will always come because of the, the hospitality of the people and the competitive advantages that we have. What we don't have or what we need to develop is competitive advantages in non-traditional areas or non-tourist areas in order to develop resilience. resilience. Okay, so you kind of actually um, answered also a question that um, someone posed, if it were up to you, which areas of the urban civil system would change to increase urban economic recovery and development post COVID-19 and why? So I don't know if you just, so you kind of yeah. answered that already, yes. So yeah. another, another right. question is, what would be some of the key elements of a better financial system that you would encourage? Um, uh, definitely, we have come, um, as in most civil law countries, Europe is bank dominated. But what we need to get away from is this bank dominance, because with bank dominance, they are only making bets or making investments in safe areas. Um, what you need is to encourage a wider diffusion of capital in terms of how it's allocated. And so, Q crisis, credit is one aspect of it, but there need to be more like institutions like that that will encourage, that will facilitate entrepreneurs or facilitate financing for entrepreneurs so that they can start a business and, and, and fail, but they can, they can create opportunities that, that and employ people that are outside the traditional safe sectors, such as hospitality. Okay. So, sorry. sorry. Thank you. So um, someone said, you know, a brief explanation more about the economic resilience in Aruba's context. Aruba is dependent over 70% of U.S. tourism customers and the situation is not so promising. 
agriculture development is not short term. What is your opinion for Aruba to be sustainable if the probability in, um, probability in tourism does not peak for Aruba to thrive? As Aruba, I believe, is thinking about GDP growth in, all, in order to be sustainable, yeah. I would think that with donative economics, um, the concept is to get away from the GDP growth um, paradigm in terms of the emphasis on focus. What we need to do is to have a, a, a financial system, an economic system that is not focused on GDP growth, but is focused on making sure that nobody gets left behind, nobody's poor or hungry or homeless. And so donative economics is one that is, is probably more relevant to our, our existing legal system. However, at the same time, we do need to diversify into uh, agriculture and into other areas that can sustain us in the long run. But those things take time and capital, and that is going to be the medium to long term, as well as adopting policies or elements of donor economics into the economy. So those are, are really long term, because we have been so dependent on tourism for so long that all our structures, infrastructure, our way of thinking, our culture has been built into tourism. Unless that changes fundamentally, and that takes time, we are not going to escape from this tourism paradigm for now. Thank you. <laughs> Another question is, what would be some of the key elements of a better financial system that you would encourage? Well, I'd, I'd encourage financial intermediaries. One thing that I would encourage, which, which is, but obviously will not happen here is a stock exchange in our words um, would encourage people to individual investors to seek um, private investors to invest in local companies the reason why that, that the central bank discourages that because of the, the fear of money laundering obviously so that is something that is will not be discouraged or will not be accepted but that is something that ideally would help to allocate or allocate capital from the people into areas of investment where they could um, where they could see that they are contributing to the economy. So if a man has five, if someone has five thousand dollars or five thousand guilders saved up, he could put that in an investment that generates the um, that generates jobs or or economic activity that builds resilience. That is something that we need to be able to get to. I'm not quite sure how, but there that's a, a way to encourage full participation in the economy. But there are challenges, as I said, money laundering is one, central bank governance is another, and, and other obstacles like that. But in the meantime, any intermediary structure, financial intermediary structure that can accommodate something like that would be helpful towards diffusing, um, providing a diffused economic growth and providing access to capital for, for small businesses. You touched on the topic of um, good governance. Um, someone is asking, you say that Aruba's civil law and the donut economics framework are a good fit for economic development post-corona. Do you think that it requires strong government leadership to take advantage of this opportunity to create a better normal for Aruba? It, it does. It does, require us to, it does require a change in culture. And this is a challenge because if we're so hooked on the tourism, the um, tourism approach, tourism development as the economic driver, it is going to take uh, someone who is going to have a, a level of vision that I've not seen among the leadership here yet, and a level of political courage to change the direction of Aruba from being tourism dependent into something that is non-tourism dependent. And that is, that is going to require uh, an effort on the, from everyone to be able to do that. Um, I'm, I'm not quite seeing that in the leadership, if that is a question. I'm not quite seeing that from the leadership. I think everybody is sort of hoping and praying that things go back to the way they were six months or three months from now, rather than trying to fundamentally change how we, how we live and how we obtain e economic growth. I, I'm that, that sort of thinking, oh, they're trying various things. I've had projects coming to me for cannabis, cannabis. Um, we have had projects coming in for agriculture, but those are not fundamental changes because you can't do those changes if you don't have the capital that supports it or inf capital infrastructure that supports it. So it's good to have ideas, 
with without capital or the infrastructure supporting it. It's just pie in the sky, as it were. Yeah, now some very good um, suggestions someone said, and they hope that these your results, will, um, the results of your analysis will be shared with the Aruba lawmakers. I can only hope that, you know, they're either looking or when we make these uh, the videos available that, you know, they will contact you. There are some other questions, um, Donald, in, of Don, where they say, so you say our civil law must modernize first. Who would need to take the leadership on this to make this happen? I, I think the local policymakers and local politicians have to. I think Aruba, um, has capacity and capability and the intellectual capacity to change its own laws to suit its, its social reality. Uh, the Netherlands has done so. That's why it's number four in the world in terms of competitive, um, in terms of being a competitive country. Um, and they, but they look after their social reality, which is different from our social reality. So we need to be able to, local politicians and intellectuals, academics from the university, need to agitate for these changes. Um, so that we are in step with the modern world. If we stay with the existing legal system, we are behind the, the existing social reality of, uh, and economic realities that face us. And then we cannot adapt uh, because, uh, as a result of the effects of the coronavirus or to the effects of the coronavirus. So we will constantly be left behind. And then only attract investments that are tourism related and that is not helping us in the long run. You know, and it ties in someone said, how has law changed in Aruba? Yeah, I don't know if, yeah, yeah. as you said, policy makers, but. Yeah, it, 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 it needs to change. Otherwise, we get into, um, into the cesspool of state, what you call state capture, where a particular group of people capture government and then determines what those laws are and for their benefit. And one could argue that you see that existing now, rather than a more democratic flooring of, of or change uh, in law based on democratic principles, based on the ideas coming from the from the general population. You, what you may have is a, a state, what you call state capture, where this, the organs of the state are captured by politicians or policymakers or particular interests that determines what laws should be made in their best interest. Okay. So could you give some examples of changes in the labor law to make um, here in Aruba, to make Aruba um, economy more resilient? So can you give some examples? I, I, I think one of the things that, based on my experience, is that there should be an ease to find, not find, sorry, to terminate employees. Um, in the sense that um, if an employee is, is, no matter how long an employee works, if he has poor performance, he should be terminated fairly rapidly um, without having to go through an entire process of proving his, 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 um, his failures or his ineptitude in terms of, of, of performing, of job performance. There should also be a situation where um, the, the sentier should be, should be limited and somewhat be not uh, not, not such a, well, I'm not saying it's, it's unfair, it's a fair thing to have a, a society of calculation done, but I, I think what tends to happen is that it tends to be the only reason why some employees stay on the job to collect a big bonus at the end, and so that needs to change, um, or perhaps not in a radical way, but in a way that encourages people to move on um, from their jobs rather than wait until they, their, their society builds up and then before they do, even though they're not producing for the company. Okay. So that is one year. Those are two years, I, I see. So I got a question. Can you explain the difference between job protection versus worker protection? Um, Donald, can you give an example? So explain it and provide an example. Job protection is, um, as Emma um, said, job protection is, is basically protecting the job from, um, from anybody else coming to take that practical job. So you protect the job rather than protect the worker. What the worker needs is going beyond the job, such as worker's safety, such as worker's health, such as worker's benefits, rather than protecting the job, which is, okay, I'm going to keep that job. I can't change that job or change that work in that job because of the, um, because of the labor laws. So I am stuck 
I'm going to keep that job position open and I can't simply change it. Worker protection looks at the protection of the entire worker, his health insurance, all of those benefits. And that's why in most developed countries, such as Switzerland, we are to do research on this, is that they have a worker protection scheme that's insurance scheme that's in place rather than um, rather than having the company take bear that responsibility. Thank you. How likely do you think the business community will embrace a more satisfying model over the maximizing model? That is a, that is a challenge um, too, because we've all been raised within the neoliberal context where we seek to maximize profit. That is what we've been trained to do from, from if you're in business school or anywhere, that you seek to maximize profits, you seek to maximize, uh, you, you, seek, you, you encourage maximizing behavior in, in, in everything that you do. Um, it's going to take a, a real change to, to say, okay, I'm not going to profit maximize. I'm going to look after the wealth of my fellow human beings, um, the health of my fellow human beings. And that is change, takes real cultural change in the business community. Some businesses are, are focused on maximization um, and, and, and to the extent that they don't care about workers or the other members in society. What Donald Economics is saying is that we need to look at other members in society. We cannot get ahead and leave and, and allow for homeless and income inequality to exist in that economy. We have to get ahead and share with everybody and do not leave anyone behind. It's not socialist thinking. It is a thinking that is sustainable thinking that people need to look after each other. And that is going to be a challenge for, for businesses, to be honest with you, because they seem to maximize. Yeah. So I think we have three more questions. I see, I, I think the topic sparked a lot of um, questions. Um, this was that you need a fundamental change to move away from tourism focused economy. What, it's, what in your opinion must happen as a very first step? But I think you kind of touched based on that already. Yeah, the, the first step is that we need to change the laws yeah. and we need to change the labor laws and company laws, company formation. Because if we're encouraging entrepreneurship as an alternative, and, we're, and, and the government, I think, is trying to do that. You can't have labor laws that, that are labor laws that restrict hiring and firing of people. And you can't have company laws that it takes three weeks or it takes, no, it takes months to form a company. That is, that is, that does not help. That's inconsistent with encouraging um, change, in the, change in the economy. And uh, someone said we also have to take the, attitude of the, the unions you have to take into um, consideration because how would you change the labor law taking into account their present attitude because they determine that is, that. that is correct um this is a unique feature about the, the dutch system dutch civil law system and the um and the Roman civil law system in that it gives there's a lot of power given to unions if you look at the say common law system that level of power is not in common law systems that is given to unions. Um, and, and this is a, a, a sort of what you call a, a, a polar model where people um, work together towards the good of society. The problem is that if you have, but they have different, people have different viewpoints on what is best for society, societal and economic development. And so unless, they, if, if, you, if you change the laws, you have to consider, um, making space for the private sector, which makes less space for the unions in decision-making. Because while the unions and government are, or state are participating, the, the seat at the table for the private sector is somewhat limited. And that needs to, they need to, all three need to participate in the process. Thank you. It sounds like you're saying that we need a broad-based collaborations of disciplines to agitate and stand up for a really better normal. Absolutely. 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 Yes, that's what we're saying. Okay. And uh, the last question, I'm not sure you can answer, I'm not sure I can answer, but it says, will the University of Aruba be including the teaching of satisfying economic models and start to educate the younger generation beyond the old model of profit first and only. I think. Yeah. Yes, we'll be, we'll be teaching Donald economics in our first year course in business economics. So uh, we have bought the book, and that will be part of the course that we will be teaching. 
So uh, rather than the traditional models, we'll be introducing students to the donut model so they, that they will get an idea as they go forward what sort of, that there are alternative economic models out there. Yes. And I see one more question, and as well, I have to say, adding to that question before that, uh, via these webinars, we're hoping on educating not only the youngsters, but the community in general on, uh, you know, the best model for Aruba, the donut economics model. So it's all part of the lifelong learning uh, process. Um, so thank you for the presentation, the stating and clear answers, very much appreciated. You mentioned the easy termination of labor contracts as one of the ways to stimulate economic resiliency of the resilience of Aruba. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that just create power imbalance by empl em allowing employees to easily get rid of their employers, so employers get rid of their employees actually. Yeah, yeah, it, it, in a way it would, but I think there needs to be all the countermeasures in place apart from, from that to minimize the impact, the, the asymmetry of power between employers and employees. One, one key thing that is also important too um, is that for new companies to form, they need to be able to hire and fire pretty easily if circumstances changes. And so that if you have rigid labor laws or market rigidity, labor cannot flow to its highest and best use. And, they, and they, um, entrepreneurs are gonna find it hard to hire or they won't be afraid to hire people when they, when, when they cannot get rid of them if circumstances change. So there has to be a balance. And that's a discussion that we need to have. It's, it's, something, it's, it's not something that you can solve within a day or two or within a week. It has to be well thought out so that it doesn't impact the, um, the labor markets or the, it does impact workers in a, a substantially negative way. And it does not lead to an exploitation to those who have and those who, do, who don't have. We need to be able to balance this in society. And that's a, that's a, a, a discussion that needs to be had going forward. So thank you very much, Donald, for that very um, interesting presentation. Thank you for those very clear answers. I saw we were getting some feedback that people really appreciated and said it was very clear and to the point. And I would like to thank all of you that um, Zoomed in with us uh, today for another Aruba Post Corona, A Better Normal um, Zoom presentation. Next week will be another very interesting topic and we hope that you then um, log in and keep on following us on, um, with our lifelong learning programs. Thank you very much and I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.